to Kelly Connor and uh, Jordi Miguel. I learned quite a lot from that. Um, now we tried to split up the talk so that I would talk a bit about what could happen next. Yeah, and actually that's not a straightforward matter. There's all sorts of questions that all of us are asking. Um, so I'm going to try and kind of explain a bit where we're at at the moment, um, and then talk about some of the things that are coming up that we know about, and hopefully at the end of the, the, the in my, 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 my talk, um, I'll be able to sort of summarise some basic ideas, but I hope that we'll talk about this more in the debate, and that you know, our two speakers and everyone in the audience will also chip in. Um, so... Um, in terms of talking about the, co the context in Catalonia at the moment, I'd just come back from there, I was there a week ago, and one of the things that really struck me the most was that normally when I go to Catalonia, I always try and meet up with my radical left friends and find out what's going on, but I didn't need to do that this time, because when I talk with my work colleagues or my family, or just friends who are not particularly political, I had these amazingly political, long conversations where they're really interested in knowing your point of view. And what I realised, which doesn't normally happen with my friends, by the way, um, wanted to know what I think, um, but, um, you know, kind of actually what I realised was that the people are open to hear kind of <laughs> radicals, yeah, and what they're saying about what's going on in, in Spain and, 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 and in Catalonia at the moment. Um, I spoke to uh, the, the partner of my brother, who lives in Barcelona, and she said to me, that people were really, really tired of everything. They were really tired. It had just been so much. And I said to her, because the general strike was coming up in a few days, I said, does that mean people are not going to go on strike? And she said, oh, no, we're not tired of protesting. Yeah? <laughs> and and that, that was an interesting kind of idea of, you know, kind of, you can't go on with this society, but you're, you're definitely willing to go on fighting for a better society. And I, I, hopefully that, that little anecdote actually represents a kind of point of view which, which is more, more, more general. Um, now, one of the interesting things that's happened with all this repression, with all this clampdown, um, we've actually seen an increased support for independence. You can see the, on the, in terms of voting, now this is the predictions for the, you know, effectively what could happen in the elections that are coming up in December, so this is done, uh, this, this uh, survey is done in November, and you can see that the pro-independence parties go slightly over the 50% mark, but not, not by much, yeah? Um, and, but actually, when, when they've done uh, interviews just asking people, do you support independence or are you against independence or do you not know, then the, the recent surveys are showing that 49% are in favour of independence, 41%, so that's 8% less, are against independence, and then there's 10% uh, uh, don't, don't, sorry, I've given, you, I've given you the wrong figures, I should have read them properly, sorry. So in, in the recent figures, 49% in favour of independence, 43% against, so 6% difference, and there's 8% um, who haven't decided which way they're going to, 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 to vote. Um, now, if we compare that with the July, uh, with July surveys, then it was 49% were against independence, 41% were in favour of independence, and 10% didn't know. So we've gone from a situation where, uh, in July, uh, there were 8% more votes for who were definitely going to go um, against independence, and now we've got a situation where we've got 6% more votes uh, or more support for, for uh, independence. That's quite a significant shift in the last few months. Um, and it's quite clear also that within... Um, the independence camp, there is a hardening of support for independence. So people are much more willing to go on the street, much more willing to lo lose a day's pay uh, in order to, to fight for their, for their rights. Now we can see that actually in terms of voting, in terms of voting intention rather, um, actually things haven't changed. If we look at September 2015, which is when the last elections happened, you can see that the, the, the support for the different parties is pretty similar, it's pretty static. I mean, the CUP is about the same, now, I should mention here that a couple of years ago, the CUP's support went down to 4%. Yeah? So they've actually come back up in, in the in three members on it. Yeah, that's right. And, and so they, they, they've actually regained a lot of support in the recent months. Now, this is interesting, what's happening in the block here, where you had a coalition between the pro-Catalan right and the pro-Catalan centre-left, which is now split. They're not going to stand together, partly because 
the Pope Catalan right is being too nervous about independence. We saw Puigdemont do a speech where he declared independence, and then eight seconds later he suspended it. Um, which is the shortest, uh, you know, at the time it was the shortest uh, independent state in the history of the world, I think. Um, and we've also seen how that people have shifted left in recent years as well. You know, we've seen the massive indignados protests, which were very big in Catalonia. We've seen general strikes. We've seen movements over eviction. We've also seen the arrival uh, in, in town halls across the Spanish state, including in Catalonia, of left-wing governments. And so there's been a shift leftwards, and actually that is a massive uh, <coughs> collapse in vote for, this, for the pro-Catalan centre right, if they're only going to get 18 seats and actually come forth. Um, they have dominated Catalan politics for the last 30 years, so that's quite major. Um, but we're also seeing, so we're seeing a polarisation around the national question. We're seeing also a leftward shift. Um, now, we don't know exactly uh, what is going to happen before the elections and what is going to happen after. Uh, there's been um, some noises made by Esquerra Republicana, ERC, and by Peter Cat that actually maybe we've not been that clever in fighting in the way we did, you know, doing a unilateral declaration and then being hit really hard. Uh, yet yesterday, Puigdemont, the Catalan president, said he thinks he made a wrong analysis of things because he thought Rajoy would enter a dialogue, yeah? And the leaders of Esquerra Republicana, the centre-left pro-Catalan party, have said very similar things in, 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 recent, in, in the recent days. Um, of course, the CUP have always taken a very different position. They've fought hard for pushing for the referendum in the first place, to defend it, to, for no vacillations, and now, that, and, and they helped build the, uh, the, the committees of defence of the Republic that have been fighting, uh, cutting the traffic in, in, the, in, the, in the last week. Uh, they actually said originally that they didn't want to support, to participate in these 21st of December elections. But I think that they felt that if they were the only pro-independence party not standing, and you didn't get a 50% pro-independence vote in the elections, they would be blamed for that. I think it was very hard for them not to stand. The other thing, of course, that's worth mentioning, because there was a big argument about whether we should boycott these elections, is that um, after the uh, referendum was repressed so savagely and not everyone could go or was, uh, was uh, confident enough to go and vote, of course, there, there is a debate in, in, uh, you know, in Catalan society about whether there really was a mandate for independence. Yeah? I mean, I think that you probably argue that they, they, there was because of the size of the vote and the size of the, 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 the yes vote within it. But there are a lot of people who are not sure about that. And so I think there's also been a kind of feeling that we, we need to go to these 21st of December elections just to make it absolutely clear that there's, a 50, there's more than 50% um, support for, um, for, for independence. Okay, um, there's also possibly going to be, and there already are signs of this, that a kind of bit of a, a, a rethink in terms of, um, you know, kind of uh, strategic um, priorities uh, after the elections. There could be, um, there could be a government coalition which is not actually like it has been so far, which was Junts pel Si was the Catalan government, and then the court were giving them kind of outside support. <coughs> yeah which we'll, I'll mention uh, a bit about afterwards. But um, that may now break up. There's talk about whether Esquerra Republicana may actually do a deal with uh, Los Comunes, of Ada Colau, you know, the kind of, the, the, the kind of left-wing, pro-sovereignty, but not pro-independence uh, coalition. Um, there's discussion about whether there could be a broader thing with the CUP involved as well. And uh, we'll have to see what happens, but clearly from the statements that are coming from the leaders of the Esquerra Republicana, it's clear that they are questioning the way they've done things so far and maybe looking for an alternative approach. And we shouldn't forget that in the, in the 2000s, Esquerra were in a Catalan government with the Socialist Party and the Communist Party, and so they've not always gone for um, nationalist blocs. Yeah? Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that may be interesting about the elections is because Junts pel Si, which was this kind of pro-independence bloc, but if you like subordinated to the right-wing politics of its president, yeah, um, that tended to mean that the social questions were left to one side, that actually there was no real question of, of the neoliberal model coming from the government. There were actually some interesting things passed, 
partly because of the pressure that came from the court. In, in the Catalan Parliament, they passed, for example, uh, preventing evictions of people. They, put, they called on closing down in migrant detention centres. Again, that's not a very nationalistic measure. That's pretty good. Um, but uh, generally, it was about keeping the same kind of economic and social policies as until now. Of course, now we're going to have a different situation in the election campaign, where the, the parties are all going to be competing for the vote, and Esquerda Republicana is probably going to want to differentiate, differentiate itself from the Catalan Tories. And so we could see that actually the social question is much more prevalent. The reason I mention that uh, is that I think that's very important tacti tacti tactically about the way things develop in the, in the future. Um, there's been a bit of a discussion. We heard it in the discussion that was in this room on Tuesday when there was different MPs from the Catalan left um, speaking um, about whether the Catalan movement is really involving the working class. Yeah? Um, actually... The truth is, there's a lot of working class people in the Catalan national movement that are in the committees for the defence of the public, that are in the massive demonstrations organised by the ANC. Um, uh, but it is true that among Spanish-speaking um, and not Catalan-speaking uh, poor worker, work, like the traditional working class, yeah, there is a, a low amount of enthusiasm for both a referendum and, and for Catalan independence. And that's an issue which I think that you know, we have to think about how, we, how we're going to, 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 to change. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons for that, of course, and this was not really discussed on Tuesday, is that the parties that have support among those kind of social groups, for example Podemos and, and other Colaus Comuns, have not done a very uh, systematic job of arguing, have not done a good job at all, of, of arguing about why people should identify with this national movement. They've tended to criticise the, re the repression against that movement, but they t they've also um, bought into the idea that the national movement is about um, winning uh, uh, the chance for Catalonia not to redistribute its income across uh, Spain and to keep its kind of income and be a richer nation. And it's, um, it's also uh, presented the movement as being something which Catalan right-wing politicians and Madrid uh, right-wing politicians have kind of concocted to create a smokescreen to hide all the corruption they're doing and get people to kind of talk about national issues and not talk about bread and butter issues like jobs and, and precarious employment, etc. And this is the kind of idea that's promoted by, by Pablo Iglesias' party and Nada Colau. And of course, this does have an impact among some people who are um, in the kind of industrial belts of the big cities in, in Catalonia. So, um, you know, we've seen how kind of a series of mistakes have been made in, in that regard. And I think that this, this explains why both in Catalonia and in the rest of Spain, we have seen a lot of people who are not in favour of independence, who have gone on the streets and defended the referendum. Yeah? Um, it, uh, there was a general strike three days later and that closed down the, um, it closed down the docks, it closed down the transport, it closed down the public sector. It closed down small shops, the countryside. This was a massive working class struggle. Yeah? It probably involved a lot of Spanish speaking people who didn't feel, and, the, and Catalan speak, speaking people who don't feel particularly in favour of independence. Um, but um, but uh, what ha is also clear is that it's been harder to keep that level of, de of protest, and we saw this in the second general strike, which was not as big. Yeah? In, in the face of the attempt to take away Catalan autonomy. I think there's been an argument, one, partly held by groups like Podemos, that you know, there shouldn't be repression by the Spanish state. There's, there's not always been the argument, one, that actually the Catalan movement is a mainly progressive movement and that it's a democratic movement. And that actually, uh, if, you know, if you're standing on the side of Rajoy, you're supporting Spanish nationalism, which is actually the most damaging and exclusive nationalism there is in the Spanish state. I think that... Um, that, ha that, that argument hasn't been won. And so we're seeing how at the moment, the movement I think is a little bit mis more disorientated. I think there's a, a degree of disorientation um, among the Catalan left and, and, and in the movement. However, I am jumping a bit here. I did have a few more things to say. But however, I do think there is um, some exciting things that are happening we should very quickly mention. The emergence of the CDRs is really crucial. Yeah? 
the, uh, also the general strike, the fact that a general strike gets called on the 3rd of October, not by the big conservative union structures, yeah, but actually by the radical unions, the anarcho-syndicalist unions, the pro-independence unions, you know, these are very small unions, radical unions, and they called the general strike, and in the end, workers joined it, and the trade union leaders had to pay lip service service to it. That's really exciting. You're starting to see a movement which is actually acting independently through grassroots action and not being called from uh, by, by the leaders above. Um, we're also uh, seeing um, this happen in a country in Western Europe, which, you know, like normally uh, in Western Europe, you know, the rule of power is, is done through hegemony and not through coerce, coercion. And now we're seeing both coercion being contested, high levels of coercion, and we're also seeing hegemony through the union structures and through the large reformist parties being really, really weak, and that's really exciting. The last thing I'd like to mention is there's also problems on the other side, on the Spanish side. Yeah? Um, actually, in the last few days, it's quite clear that Rajoy is kind of holding back from continuing with the offensive. Yeah? There's a lot of signs that they're even trying to influence the judges not to give like heavy sentences so that the president of the Catalan parliament actually was given bail rather than in prison when she turned up in court last week. Uh, and that was after lots of tweets by the Spanish government saying, please don't, 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 don't well, indirectly saying, don't put her in, in jail. Um, we're seeing how um, actually, even though publicly the European Union is saying we're with Spain, which is outrageous and should be condemned, behind closed doors there's a lot of pressure on Spain to hold back from doing things like arresting a whole bloody government, which nobody understands in Europe. Um, and so uh, they're actually feeling quite disorientated on the other side as well. So we've got this kind of grassroots movement coming up, all sorts of very difficult discussions about how the political parties should work together before and after the elections and what kind of governments should come out of that. There probably will be a majority vote for independence, pro-independence parties on the 21st of December. But there'll also be all sorts of strategic debates about how you can actually involve more of the working classes in this struggle. Because if we don't do that, if we don't have a kind of project which goes beyond just having a, a, a nation state, but actually offers something where there's real social improvement to people, then we're going to find that Catalonia is too divided or not hasn't got the commitment that is necessary to fight to the end to bring about self-determination. And I'll stop there because I think I've gone a bit over time.